We're here to give you some answers tonight. Award-winning author Kamala Shamsi, Shadow Minister for Immigration and Citizenship Dan Tian, Minister for Youth and Early Childhood Education Anne Ali, who's also a leading counter-terrorism expert. Cyber security expert Alastair McKibben, whose firm Cyber CX has been engaged by Medibank as a strategic advisor. And Professor of Political History and International Security, Joe Syracuse. Please make them all feel welcome. Medibank has decided not to pay a ransom, despite hackers threatening and following through on the threat to release highly sensitive customer information, which includes abortion records and history of drug and alcohol abuse. Cyber security criminals are often from highly sophisticated, highly profitable networks of transnational criminals and rogue states. On the one hand, paying a ransom may encourage more attacks. On the other, not paying a ransom may result in millions of Australians' private information being released. How does the panel uh, propose that government and businesses manage this dilemma when a cyber security hack has occurred? Alistair McKibben, let's start with you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, firstly, can I say that it's, it's truly tragic what has occurred. I'll, I'll echo what the Minister for Home Affairs and Minister for Cyber Security has said. It's a dog act. Shameless people, criminals are online. I've spent 20 years or more dealing with these online criminals. There's no good answer to whether or not uh, a, an organisation should pay an extortion threat. Uh, and until uh, someone has walked in the shoes of an online victim, as in an organisation that's victimised by these criminals, it's really uh, hard for anyone to judge. Uh, Medibank clearly has made a decision not to pay, and that's largely been uh, applauded uh, in the media and by the public. Uh, but that's done, I'm sure, and I, I'm clearly conflicted, as you've said, uh, with a heavy heart. There's no right or wrong answer uh, when these criminals strike. Uh, it's a series of least worst decisions and Medibank has made a decision. It's our job now as a community, frankly, to wrap ourselves around those victim organisations and more importantly, the victims, uh, you know, millions of people that are affected here, some potentially very significantly. The more we talk about the specifics of, of what this criminal has released, the more we're actually giving oxygen to that criminal enterprise. Um, paying uh, is a legitimate option, it's not illegal. Um, but how do you trust a criminal to return or delete information that has already proven they're a criminal and can't be trusted? So I can understand how the decision is made, and I'll stop in a second. I'll just say that now, uh, the more we talk about the specifics of what information they are dumping on the dark web, hard to find, but still exposing information, the more we're putting pressure on the next lot of organisations that will surely be extorted by these criminals. It's a really interesting answer and there's a bit there I want to unpack and I appreciate that uh, you're a little conflicted, you can't talk too specifically about what's going on at Medibank. You were called in post-event to provide advice to them. But generally, coming back to Amina's question, which is about this conundrum of whether to pay the ransom or not, I think you just said that it is a legitimate option in, in some cases, so your advice it presumably isn't always, just don't pay the ransom. Oh, absolutely not. I, why, I why believe not? in... Uh, you want to give organisations the most options uh, kept on the table for as long as possible. Um, so you have to, by the way, engage... And this might sound crazy to the audience, and I'd love your feedback. You have to engage with the criminals online and ask them what it is they've got. You need to find out what their intentions are. You need to understand the groups they're affiliated with. Because while it's pretty anarchic online, some groups behave differently to others. So sometimes it's also buying time so organisations can better communicate with their stakeholders, customers, government, uh, their suppliers, people that rely upon them. Um, so it's, it's never a, an easy decision to suggest to pay. Ransomware threat actors traditionally lock up computers at the same time as having exfiltrated data. And so the concept of paying to unlock a computer system is fundamentally different to the concept of paying to ask the criminal to delete the data. Can I add this? The reason why it's still a viable option is we live in a horrendously permissive threat environment. Criminals come up to the door of your house, all of your houses and all of our businesses every day. They don't just rattle the doorknob to see if the door's locked, they'll break into that door. If that was happening offline, you'd all revolt. You'd say it's unacceptable. But online, we accept the fact, still today, in 2022, that criminals can come up and victimise us. 
we've got to be careful not to re-victimise the organisations and the consumers who trusted them to protect their data um, by, uh, you know, again, sort of forcing them into an, an option of paying or not paying. Uh, but just on this question, and Ali, the government's advice is don't pay, don't pay. the ransom. Do yeah. you accept there may be times, as Alastair McKibben is suggesting, where it might be an option? Well, I think the operative word here is criminal. Right? And there's no such thing as an honest criminal. So even paying the ransom uh, doesn't necessarily guarantee that the data that they have is going to be released, whether it's on the black um, market, on the dark web or elsewhere. That's the first thing. But I think that the other important point to make here is what Alastair says here is that... You know, Cybercrime is going to get worse and worse and it's going to escalate and there will be there, there will be new modes of it. And I just want to put it back to, to Alistair. I know you, you, you're talking about the organisations. I think organisations need to start seeing cyber security as part of their core business and yeah. developing cyber safe cultures within their organisations as well. A lot of the time, a cyber breach is from the weakest link in the chain, which is the human link. Uh, someone who has fallen for a phishing scam or, or some kind of scam within the organisation. And yeah, I, I don't think that there are, are enough organisations who have paid enough attention to developing cyber secure cultures within their organisation. If, if your, your advice is never pay the ransom, mm. why not make it against the law? Um, that's a good question and one that I don't have an answer to. But I think, you know, at this stage, I think the advice is pretty clear. Right. Don't pay the ransom. OK, but it's not illegal to do so. It's not illegal Dan Tien, you so. were the minister uh, responsible for cyber security uh, when Malcolm Turnbull was prime minister. What's your view, coming back to Amina's question, this conundrum of to pay the ransom or not? Well, in the first instance, you shouldn't pay the ransom uh, because you can't trust the crooks. And the problem is, if you pay the ransom, they can then get almost a double ransom because then they can go and monetize the data. And so they actually get double the reward for, for what you're doing. But I, you can never say absolutely never. Um, and that's why, to make it outright illegal mm. to, to pay the ransom, I think would be cutting off your nose to spite yourself because there might be a very rare instance where, where it is the right thing to do. And we Were you ever aware of that as Minister? Uh, look, I wasn't as Minister and I think you would find that it is pretty rare. So, for, as a former diplomat, this is one of the great conundrums, of course, you face if there is a kidnapping in a foreign country. And what, what do you do in those instances? Now, once again, the formal government position is you, you never pay the ransom. But there might be ways or means mm. that you could get a release of someone and, and save a life. So that's why you would never say never. But you, in the first instance, it should be don't pay the ransom. And I agree with, with Anne. One of the things all of us have to understand is this threat isn't going away. When, when I was Australia's first cyber security minister, I worked with Alistair, and one of the things that we set about doing was just getting out and publicising the fact to businesses, uh, to individuals and to government that this threat is real. And one of the things we used to say to, to, to companies was, this has to be a priority around your boardroom. Well, what okay. you would and, tend and, to and see, it would be right down the bottom. And arguably it needs to be a high priority, which we're going to come to. Yeah. I mean, let me just come back to you on this, because I understand uh, you were the victim of a cyber attack previously. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's correct. About four years ago, I found out that my computer had been hacked and a scammer was posing as my telephone company provider and had been redirecting my payments. And so for about six months, I was thinking that I was paying my phone bills, whereas it was actually going to the scammer. Mm. And after investigating mm. that further, I discovered that they had opened an account and purchased a phone in my name, and I had been paying for that unknowingly as well. Did you get the money back? Mm. I did eventually, mm. Um, mm. in the form of credit to... Right. ..with the phone company provider. Elon Musk wants to create an internet where the most privileged people in society can punch down at marginalised groups. Queer people, people of colour, women and gender minorities and the Jewish community without facing any consequences. In one of his first tweets as owner, he stated, 
Comedy is now legal on Twitter. But the real comedy, in my opinion, is that after people started making parody accounts impersonating Elon, he banned them. What is the panel's position on Elon's policy changes on e-safety and how should Australia and Australians respond? Melissa, thank you. Kamala, what do you think? Um, you know, I think we, we pay a lot of attention to what Elon Musk is doing because he's telling us things all the time. He'll tell us something one day and the next day he'll change his mind again. Um, I'm far more concerned about uh, the people who aren't telling us what they think. I mean, what Elon Musk has compared to, in terms of numbers, Twitter has, what, 350 million? Um, Facebook has near 3 billion. Is that an OK space? And we get so focused on the individual, and we know about this one individual, so we think about what he's going to do, rather than thinking about the platforms and how they're working. Facebook is not a benign space. None of these are benign spaces, um, and none of them are existing for our good. I think what's going to happen with Twitter is he's going to try a lot of different things and see how people respond, see how his advertisers respond. Um, and I think we're going to see, right now, there are a lot of people saying, oh, I'm going to leave, I'm about to leave. Um, and this is going to be like all those Americans who said, if George Bush wins the election, I'm going to Canada. If George Bush wins the next election, I'm going to Canada. If Trump wins, I'm going to Canada. And all the Canadians are standing there saying, well, where are you? <laughs> um, you know, the fact is, we go on these social media platforms we find things we enjoy and we, we get comfortable. It goes back to the previous conversation. We get much too comfortable with, well, I'll just use it this way. I don't have to pay attention to that. There's all this other stuff going on. Um, and I think we need to really step back and think about, we sort of landed into the world of the online world. You know, I mean, I was at university when it was this great wild west. Um, and I don't think we have yet had the conversations with ourselves um, in, enough about what we are doing in terms of the very concept of privacy, which absolutely does not exist in the way it did. You're, you're on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. It sounds like you're going to stay on Twitter. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. Mm. Um, and I lie to myself all the time about them because, you know, what do you I can, mean by that? because, well, I can be sitting in um, Sydney and having great conversations with many Pakistani cricket fans about the World Cup semi-final, yeah. and that feels great, and there's a sense of community, um, and you're getting information fast, and you really like the feeling of getting information fast and knowing what people are saying, and you, and you enter this sort of siloed-off world where even though you're aware all this other stuff is going on, you are living, and mm. I'm including myself in that. Um, you're living in the siloed off world. I know what's being said about Muslims and migrants and other people, and it's nothing new. This isn't starting with Elon Musk. You think this has been a pleasant world on Twitter for all for marginalised communities uh, until no. now? No, it's very it's very yeah. honest take. Joe, let me come to you on this. What what are your thoughts on well, Elon God. Musk and Twitter? Uh, I, I don't like Elon Musk. I think he's a fruitcake. <laughs> Tell us what you really think. Stay <laughs> on this, and he, he plays us from day one. He knew he wanted to become a U.S. citizen, but he knew that coming from South Africa, that was going to be harder. So he became a Canadian citizen first, and then he worked his way into America. You, you cannot, and this is the guy before him, too, and all the others, you, you can't put someone in charge of a network that allows hundreds of millions of people to say or not say what they want to say, and you're in charge of moderating or what goes forward, what goes back. The day that uh, Donald Trump lost the uh, 2020 election, he had 88 billion followers on Twitter, and he only had 74 million votes that day. He had more Twitter followers than he had votes. Now, I've been to Europe a number of times to see security, uh, security conferences, and some very serious people used to wake up every morning and look at Brexit and Twitter to see what they were going to do for the rest of the day. I mean, people are able to control people with these kinds of things. The idea that we have these huge public spaces that are really uh, 
uh, unregulated by government. This is the Wild West, the, these places. Well, and I think we ought to do well, more about it. Well, it's not really that. unregulated. Well, David, I promise I'll speak less at the tail end of this uh, when I get out of my sort of zone. It, in fact, stop me <laughs> later. But, um, I wouldn't but, dare. But you might recall, I was the first e-safety You were. You were. Uh, this was back in 2015? Uh, yeah, I think it was yeah. 2015, around that. Social media was probably a little different back then. Yeah, and, and um, it w well, yes, but equally wasn't a pleasant place for oh. women, yeah, uh, for children, for successful. still a very divisive place. Mm. Twitter and all of those other social media platforms have become a really important communications tool for all of us. They've gone beyond those companies now. Uh, you know, Twitter is the world's newsroom. It's the online newsroom, whether we like it or not. Um, Australia moved the first legislation in the world to start pushing our values, our norms, onto our part of that internet, as is right and proper. Um, doesn't mean you have to agree with everything on there. The unwinding of that, that, those staff in Twitter by Elon Musk and the sacking of staff or the announcement by Meta today that they were getting rid of thousands of people. You should just clarify, so Twitter looks like they've sacked uh, about half their staff and a lot of that is people who do the content moderation. A lot of people moderation. are those trust and safety yep. people. The people that are actually there doing the horrendous job of sifting through the sewerage of the internet, trying to keep us marginally safe. People that would have to respond to the new e-safety commissioner, Julia McGrath, she's not that new, she's been there for years. Yeah, she's um, been a while. Does a great job. Mm. Who, who's she going to write to now to enforce Australian law and Australian standards on our part of the internet? Mm. That's a dangerous place for, to be. The last thing I'd say is this. These social media platforms become the vehicle for disinformation and misinformation, which pick at the very fabric of our society, our democracy, mm. and we've seen the effect it's had. Mm. Uh, January 6. Um, you know, the, the riots at the Capitol, that was largely driven online. Mm. And until you realise that free speech doesn't mean the ability to harm people, mm. you know, you have a contra view, that's fine. Yeah. Here I am, sorry. I, I, I just want to bring in here the issue of, of youth and the content because, um, you know, you know, maybe we do choose what we watch, but a lot of people don't, mm -hmm. and that's because of the algorithms. And, in fact, uh, I want to look at... Uh, just mention some research that was done by Reset Australia, which showed that 41% of 16- and 17-year-olds were exposed to content that was... Uh, that underlines the incel uh, discourse and that could lead, according to Reset, that could lead to a violent act. And, in fact, in the Reset research shows that some of these young people are getting this content more often than they're having Sunday dinners, right? And this is through the algorithms. This is something that should worry everybody, mm. that mm. young people... And they're getting younger and younger through the algorithms that are set through these social media platforms are being... are, are viewing and are being exposed to disinformation, misinformation, yes, but white supremacist content from homegrown, homegrown domestic white supremacist content, uh, anti-Semitic content, uh, far-right content and incel content, F and particularly young white men are yeah. being exposed to this content. Yeah. And you're talking what sort of age again? This was 16, 16 17 year olds. Year olds. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone who sees this content is going to you know, automatically be radicalised. No, the radicalisation process is much more complex than that. But what we do know about why people leave extremist movements behind is because they get exposed to something that plants a seed of doubt and makes them question their beliefs. Now, if the algorithms keep feeding you and feeding you and feeding you the same content... Echo chamber. You're never going to get that... Mm. You're never going to get that exposure to the things that challenge that content. Dan Tien, just coming back to Melissa's yeah. question, though, about the arrival of Elon Musk at Twitter, what do, what do you think? Are you going to stick well, around? Well, Twitter's a gutter. It, it's a gutter. Mm. So my advice would be, if you don't like it, Get out of it. And um, are you are you still on there? I I am still on it, David. <laughs> <laughs> I am. But <laughs> hear me out. I'm on it because you know what I use it for. What? There are people in that gutter who have a crack at me the whole time, in the most vile way, right? And they do it to Lee Sales, and Lee yep. Sales has said it's the extreme left that does it to her, right? What I do is I poke the bear every now and again. I just why, say... Why, why? 
why, 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 because why, 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 I mean, it's a gutter. It's a gutter. You've got to admit get what it is. Gutter, well, get out of the gutter. I That's, got out of it. I got out well, of it a long well time ago. Well done. I'll call it a factory I, so, I didn't go on it for... A, <laughs> I, I sort of stayed away for a little while and then... Just every Mr. now and again, yeah. I just sort of. I got have to say, the world of Pakistani but... cricket fans, that's not a gutter. That's very <laughs> nice. <laughs> my series is. You got it. You, you, you both, what did you call it? A festering cesspool? I've always called it a festering cesspool. So you're not on there, you call it a gutter. There. Maybe you should just be following the Pakistani... Um, yeah, yeah, cricket yeah. fans, we're yeah. very funny. Yes, yeah. 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 we make you laugh. We, we love things that are funny, <laughs> yeah. and I love cricket like you, and I was very keen to see that you still play cricket. That's fantastic. Oh, we're getting a little off topic here. <laughs> it is. Uh, so, but, anyway. but seriously, when it comes to Twitter, it is, it's a gutter, and if you don't like it, and I would say to everyone, get off it, because the stuff that is what about, on there... Say that to yourself as well, just to, just oh, to look. I, I'm happy to get off it. Seriously, okay. I only the only reason that I have any interest in it whatsoever is to see what is on it. Yeah. And the other thing is, it is really <laughs> bad. <laughs> no, no. Well, the, no as a, no, as someone who, I, who is in a position, because I've got to tell you, with a lot of these things, know, it, yeah. it's not only radicalisation, the stuff and Twitter. It, this is something that the e safety commissioner has written to them about. The child pornography the sharing that of is uh, yeah, material. Yeah, it is. Mm. Uh, it's okay. appalling, and we do need which to be a, a lot which is, firmer which is with also these illegal. companies. It's also it's illegal. Yeah. And do you know what happened when she wrote okay. to them? Nothing. Yeah. Well, I think we get the impression there's a fair bit of bad stuff uh, going on there. But I think, uh, Alice, you made the fair point uh, as well that you know sometimes is helpful information that oh, can be found course. there as well. Uh, the, communities that form and, and no, all that. It, so. it, it is a vehicle that it, it, gets exactly. misused, but it's still legitimate. It needs to be protected. Uh, because is that's it how legitimate? Okay. Is it really legitimate? That <laughs> we yeah, Dan, I'll take your answer. I think we've got you and you'll take your answer. I mean, we're talking about Twitter, but there's a whole lot of other ones as well. You won't have us back. The considers itself to be the bastion of democracy, and yet the primary instigator of the January 6 attack on the Capitol building continues to deny losing the election and well may be re-elected to office in 2024. Do you see a future for true democracy in the United States? And what will it take to establish a cohesive society? Big question, Joe Syracuse, what do you think? Look, um, democracy in America is a work in progress. It's been going on since the 1760s. And we've had a lot of strange people involved in, in the process who've excluded a lot of other people. And, you know, and, and America has done very well with immigrants and we got all kinds of uh, minority groups in, in government. Uh, when, when you get up to Donald Trump, for example, nothing can really explain what he was doing. There. He was a <laughs> television host who wound up as president of the United States. Now, he, he was elected by people who'd given up on Washington. You know, he didn't have a movement. The movement found him. He was going to go to Washington, give Washington the middle finger and, you know, have a good time and all the rest of it. And so uh, he, he, he's a major threat now because he's kind of unloosed all the fruitcakes in the hills of America and all the strange people are now coming down from the hills and getting involved. And they all went to the people's house on January 6th to tell the people's government that uh, they're very unhappy with them, which, by the way... Thomas Jefferson might have been amused by the whole thing, as a matter of fact. But the, the, Sorry, the, amused by... By, by... by the protests, because Jefferson said that the tree of liberty has to be nourished every 20 years by the blood of tyrants and patriots. He wouldn't see a problem there. You know, I grew up in the 60s when it's cities bit, burned. A bit more than protests, though, to be fair. Just, 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 yeah, just yeah that's true. But in, I mean... in the 60s, cities burned. People died all over the place. Mm. The anti-war, the anti-everything movement. I mean, today, when I look at these movements, I think, well, it's kind of a pale thing of what was going on in the 60s. Now, my point is this. I, I think uh, America will come through. It won't be recognizable. But my beef is, and finally here, America's in this position... Australia may even be in this position one day, and half of Europe and Asia, too, because I believe that the, the political and cultural elites have left pe let people down over the last 20 years. These are the people who didn't explain globalization, though they enjoyed the hell out of it. These are people who knew things were going. These are the people who tell us we've got to take the lead in, in climate change and don't do a damn thing about it. These are the people who take the lead in everything. <laughs> now, I, I think... I think the world, because of the, you know, the deference we've had for the elites, uh, I, I think they've left us leaderless, and I think they're incompetent. 
you know, and this is why when I get near a university, I say you want to start pumping money into universities that young people are going to have to figure this problem out because Australia doesn't have forever. The history of Australia is not carved in stone. We're going to wind up one day as a little patch on a wall in the British Museum if we're not real careful. <laughs> if we're not real careful. But the point is, is that I, I think there's a lot of reasons for the things that are happening. But yeah. what what drives me nuts for the past 40 years is how the elites have gone from these people you trust during the Cold War. They did a great job. And in the last 20 years, not such a great job. And we don't trust these anymore. And I can just prove my point by saying that is there one person in Australia who can go on television or radio and explain to somebody, explain to the nation in a crisis, uh, or settle people down or explain what's going on around the world. I mean, 40 years ago, you had lots of people who could do that. Mm -hmm. But today, I, I don't see that. Anyway, me, I think we've been let down up and down the board. Coming back to Mark's question about the fate of democracy, uh, I suppose, in the US. Um, Carmela, what do you think, in, uh, particularly in light of yesterday's midterm elections, mm -hmm. where the Republicans <coughs> made modest gains, but not the red wave that many had, <coughs> had predicted, uh, and there's now a bit of a question mark over the... the prospects of Donald Trump running as a presidential candidate again. What do you think when you look at the United States and the future of its democracy? Um, I'm worried about democracies everywhere. You know, I mean, I grew up in, in Pakistan under military rule. I was 15 years old when democracy arrived in the form of a 35-year-old woman, Benazir Bhutto. And <coughs> to be young and to feel democracy come alive, it's extra it was such an extraordinary event. Mm -hmm. Um, and I remember feeling everyone else is so unlucky because they aren't here in this moment. Mm -hmm. And now I sort of feel like, I, I feel as though I saw democracy being born in one country. And now I'm seeing it in infirmity yeah. around the globe. Um, it does feel scary. It feels, you're, you're right, as though people don't trust their politicians anymore. I think the Iraq war was a major part of that. Mm. Um, the sense of we were lied to, we mm. protested against it, and then there were just lies told about weapons of mass destruction and in order for this to go ahead. Um, I'm also, I think we don't talk enough about the role of money in government um, donations. If you look at, if we're going back to America, um, one of Joe Biden's great successes was seen as, as what came to be known as sort of the climate the climate bill, the most significant climate legislation to happen in America. But it was held up in the Senate because it couldn't get through till Joe Manchin signed off in it. We know it is a fact that he is the largest recipient of donations from the energy sector. Hmm. And until he said, and, and until the rest of the Democrat Party agreed to the rewording of certain things that gave con concessions, that bill didn't go through. How is this democracy? How on earth is this democracy if someone who is being paid by the energy sector a huge amount of money in donations is able to hold up the most significant climate legislation America's ever known? Just to pick up on the, the democratic will of the people expressed in those elections uh, yesterday, our time in the midterms, one of the striking features was the role of women uh, voters after the Roe v Wade decision uh, in, in the United States, overturning the abortion uh, law. Um, we also saw women play a very influential role in the Australian election, Anne Ali, um, turfing out the Morrison government, a lot of independents elected, Labor as well. Um, are women playing a more influential role in elections? And, and Dan Turn, can you your thoughts on that too? I don't know. I think women have always played an influential role in elections. I mean, simply by the fact that we're 50, more than 50% of the population, right? Mm. Um, but I think that women's issues were more front and centre mm. of, of, of elections and are becoming more front and centre of elections. Um, particularly, you know, in, in Australia at the last election, there were certainly issues. Many of them were brought to, to light through the issues that happened within Parliament House and the treatment of women in Parliament House. But also we had the great the Women's March um, and we were all told that we should be grateful that we weren't shot with bullets. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think... I think I think women have always played a part, a political role, but it, it, it's issues, women's issues yeah. now that are at the fore, and I think that's a bloody good thing. Dan <laughs> Good for you, Anne. Um, well, as someone whose mother was a member of Parliament... Was a woman. ..and a woman... <laughs> ..was my mother and a woman. 
Um, uh, of course, I, I think women have always played a significant role, but I think we're starting to see in representation them expanding that role, and I think that's a, that's a very good thing. I mean, my mother was my, my political mentor. She, w she was outstanding, did a fantastic job as a member of the Kennett government. They came into power when the state was completely bankrupt on its knees and were able to turn it around in no time and she had the very difficult job of transforming the health system here in Victoria and did and did a remarkable job at it and um, you know one of the things I think this uh, Victorian state government needs now is my mother back running the health ministry. <laughs> exactly. so, uh, okay. um, but look so I yeah right. let's see more women. It's consensus and, on that. Um, let's, um, let's make sure that they're just a part of it. Because we've important. got you here Joe let me just uh, come back to US politics very briefly. Donald Trump, does he run? Yes, sir. He's going to. Um, it's going to be a rematch with, um, with Joe scary. Biden. So Joe Biden, Biden runs no as reason. well. And we're going to have the 45th president and the 46th president uh, go for it in 2024 to see who becomes the 47th president. Please thank our panel Kamala Shamsi, Dan Tian, and Ali, Alastair McKibben, and Joe Syracuse. Thanks to those of you here and at home as well for driving the conversation. Next week, Stan Grant will be back live in Sydney with plenty to discuss, including the anticipated meeting between Anthony Albanese and Xi Jinping. Joining the panel to answer your questions will be the former US Ambassador Joe Hockey, Chair of the Intelligence and Security Committee Peter Khalil, writer and filmmaker Santella Chinga Ipe, and one of the world's leading war experts, Professor Lawrence Friedman and foreign affairs columnist for the Financial Times, Gideon Ruckman. Head to our website to register to be in the audience. Good night.